out there. I mean, her social media stuff is, I mean, it's funny, it's family friendly, it's, you know, you can relate to her, it's all of that. It makes for a very good representative of the city of Norfolk. Ready? You know. The stenographer back there is the only one that won't be happy at how fast we go. <laughs> her fingers are fine. Her fingers are fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Mr. Lord's got this. Her fingers a closed meeting of the Council of the City of Norfolk in accordance with provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. Adopt the resolution, Ms. Doyle, Aye. Ms. Graves, Aye. Ms. Johnson, Aye. Ms. McClellan, Aye. Mr. Riddick, Aye. Mr. Smeagle, Aye. Mr. Thomas, Aye. Mr. Alexander. Aye. Mr. Smith. All right, man, thank you. Um, I'm going to run you through the agenda real quick. We're, going, uh, uh, we're in good shape. We're going to make up a little bit of time uh, and talk to some of the folks that are making presentations. And um, if uh, we go too fast, just ask us some questions. But um, uh, Barbara Heller and uh, Cindy Curtis with Heller & Heller, you remember one of the commitments we made to you at the end of last year's budget was to do an assessment of uh, recreation parks and open space and, and bring forward a strategic plan. And, um, and Barbara and Cindy have come in and worked with Daryl and his team and really done an outstanding job of, of assessing uh, so sort of that department, and so they'll, they'll jump up and give you up the presentation there. Um, uh, Doug Beaver will introduce Bob Crum. You all know Bob Crum with the uh, Hampton Rose Planning District Commission and the uh, uh, Transportation Planning Organization, and um, uh, going to give you a, a, literally 10 minutes on JLUS, the, the uh, joint land use study that we've done with Virginia Beach, uh, Norfolk, and the Navy, which really tees us up to start to have some conversations about defense access funds, um, uh, roads, uh, funding off base, and uh, the mayor and I are in a policy meeting next week, and as that thing starts to wrap up, just wanted to, uh, the whole council to have a sense of, of where all that stands. Um, Greg will jump up and give you, we'll talk a little bit about the operating budget, and, and make sure we'll, he'll give you an overview and see what kind of questions we've got as we lead into next week's or the 23rd conversation of really, all right, you all got a pretty good sense of what's in, what's not in, and we're starting to hear from you a little bit of some things that folks want uh, to add or take out of that budget, and we want to uh, get that conversation going in real earnest on the 23rd, so we'll tee up that conversation tonight. And then Jared will take uh, five or 10 quick minutes. Um, you'll have on your, you remember I mentioned that during the budget presentation on your agenda, that on the um, 23rd will be the memorandum of, of understanding between the city and uh, the Hampton Roads Economic Development Alliance and all the localities. A few of them have already approved that. Most are, are uh, I think us, uh, Chesapeake, Newport News, others are approving it uh, on the 23rd. But I want him to tell you all, and frankly, the public, sort of what we're doing, and he'll do that quickly. Um, so with that, I do have one quick item I want to do that is, that is a, a fun piece. And you'll remember that um, I want to is anybody can make Jason? Ah, Jason. Jason, if you would come forward. Jason uh, Akira Soma is our artist in residence. You remember we talk a lot about being the most collaborative, connected, and creative uh, community. And part of that, uh, we really have tried to emphasize this idea of, of creativity. Went through a process to bring on an artist in residence and um, folks from Old Dominion, Norfolk State, the Governor's School, and the Chrysler Museum served on the panel, helped us uh, from 90 applicants. Call that down. I just want you to know Jason was um, born in Norfolk, uh, graduated from the Governor's School for the Arts. Uh, attended Virginia Commonwealth University. His mom still lives here. 
He has spent the last decade in New York really building an impressive portfolio of not only his work, but his accomplishments. Uh, he is the first American to receive the prestigious Rolex Arts Initiative Award. He will be featured as a solo artist, this is great, for the Times Square Art Alliance to exhibit a short film on all the iconic screens in Times Square for the entire month of June. Um, he's got over 20 years working as a technology and creative consultant for a lot of different um, institutions, uh, commercial enterprises. His is a, a great story. He started with us on April 1st. He's got a fun story I was going to ask him to share with you tonight, but Jason, we don't have time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so hold that thought. Uh, but, uh, it's just a fun piece about uh, kind of how oh, folks gosh. are recognizing him on the street and asking the questions, and uh, so maybe we'll, we'll do that next meeting. But uh, hope everybody gets a chance. To Welcome. Meet you. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to ask Barbara Heller and uh, Cindy Curtis to step forward and walk you through sort of their their work and their assessment and um, of uh, our post. So Barbara, welcome to town. Uh, appreciate you being here. Tonight, we're going to do a, an overview of our process, and just to back up a little bit, what happened as far as why we're here, Cindy and I are here, is we responded to a request for a proposal that was uh, really at the um, direction of Doug, and I, I do this for a living. I, I have a background in parks and recreation and love doing operational assessment work, so teaming with Cindy. Uh, we came here, and a lot of times when I do these kinds of assignments, it's about a department that's really not performing well, and how do we, how do we turn a department around? This wasn't the case uh, for RPOS. It was really about what do we need to do to strengthen the organization? What can we do to create best practice approaches to the way the organization operates? So just as far as what we're going to go over quickly, uh, we'll only take about 15 minutes of your time. Uh, but just going over the goals, uh, some of the strengths and uh, areas for improvement, and those are really all based on what we heard from all the engagement meetings that we did. Cindy met with city council. We talked to department heads. We talked to city management. We talked to lots of staff for RPOS. Um, and then organization structure review was a big part of our endeavor. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, key areas of the assessment as well as recommendations. So the goals included things such as what do we need to do to recommend to strengthen the department? How can we create better efficiencies and effectiveness in the way the department operates? Uh, let's take a look at the organizational structure based on what we know of the industry and how other similar organizations structure themselves as well as how is it best suited toward the needs of Nor Norfolk community. Um, and then the next one is um, identifying core services, getting a sense of the scope of services that are offered from community centers to all sorts of recreation programs. And then the last one is just taking a look around other agencies, comparable agencies that have good best practice approaches and what can we learn from them. So from the engagement summary, all of these bullets are items that we heard from folks. These weren't our opinions. So a, a lot of comments about the staff, very responsive, very passionate about what they're doing. Um, they're really proud about what they do. Uh, excellent leadership throughout the organization. Uh, the variety of programs and services, always trying to do more with less, like so many agencies we uh, encounter. And then the department was successful in achieving certification by the Commission of Accreditation for Park and Recreation Agencies. Uh, great concern for social equity, making sure that there's access and accessibility to programs. And then just overall, good employee survey results. We sent out a questionnaire to all the employees of the organization and noted what great strengths were, what were areas to improve. And those scores as compared to other agencies were very good. Um, and then just opportunities for improvements, I won't go through all of those. Uh, and, and some of these have to do with some, some good efforts to help position the department for the future, like doing a community needs assessment, identifying truly what statistically valid survey, what are the true needs of the community. Uh, the department would really benefit from having a strategic vision, and hopefully this study will help position the department for that. Um, and then there's always a conflict, I think, in almost any organization between what was and what is and where we're going to be, and the tension created among employees in terms of let's change or let's stay the same. 
Um, and then some infrastructure concerns, lots of comments about do we have the right number of amenities and facilities. Uh, and then we also identified that pricing of, of services is very low. That also came up as part of the engagement. And then there's a couple of more um, items there. Cindy's going to talk. I'm sorry? Yes, uh, relationship with athletic associations and schools are problematic, yes. Um, so yes, uh, we noted that too, and that wasn't intentionally left. I, I'm just feeling a sense of needing to get through this. <laughs> so uh, Cindy's going to talk about organization structure. Um, this is the current organizational structure. We've got the director of the department who oversees um, an assistant director, and then you've got three bureau managers and a superintendent, which really is the same as a bureau manager. We find this to be a very um, old school type of alignment um, in terms of how government tended uh, or has in the past aligned itself. Um, in taking a look at everything that's going on, we wanted to make recommendations that we thought would help the organization become nimble, drive decision making to the lowest point possible so that you didn't have to wait to get answers to issues that customers need to be have taken care of. So we recommended in taking a look at the work that you el eliminate the current assistant director position. You ha are really blessed with extraordinarily strong bureau managers and superintendents who we feel could step into the director's role when he or she is away, he currently is away, which allows them a growth opportunity and some preliminary succession planning. We recommend that you save those dollars and invest them elsewhere in areas that I will talk about. Um, marketing and communications in parks and recreation is extraordinarily important and currently the department is only supported, and I don't mean that in a deleterious manner, but only supported by a citywide person, about three quarters of a full-time person. That is not enough for the community to stay aware of the multitude of activities and excellent things that are happening within the department and we really recommend bringing on a full-time position that would develop uh, communications and marketing plan to improve awareness and understanding and participation in the activities. Um, we talk about planning a lot. There's a re recommendation at the end. We believe you need a senior planner to drive programs forward, to drive forward a strategic planning process, to drive forward your master planning process, because currently your planner right now is just down in the weeds trying to deal with the multitude of projects that are happening. You need somebody that's able to drive the vision forward. Um, we believe that you need a data analyst position. Metrics, you have a ton of metrics. The department has great metrics coming from its technology system and nobody to evaluate them. You should be using those metrics to drive business decisions. And those business decisions will make the department more nimble and quickly finding out what might be dinosaur programs that need to be laid to rest and programs that the community is asking for that might generate more following, more support. Um, the NEL program, fantastic program, currently under administration. So administration is supposed to be internally focused to making sure your business systems are operating well. NEL is an externally focused program and an important one. We recommend that it be moved elsewhere within the department rather than administration. Um, filling a receptionist position, they lost their receptionist position in the corporate administrative office. And there is no one person that makes sure when there is a community outreach that it is followed through on. So you are losing business at time. There should be a presence and a voice on the phone to receive calls and to manage those. And there's ample opportunity for that with all of the people that are participating. Uh, strengthen the technology systems support. We highly recommend that you bring on a full-time technologist that would work with corporate IT to maximize the technology systems within parks and recreation because they are not being fully maximized. Therefore, you're not as efficient as you could be. And this position would pay for itself easily over time in terms of approved business outcomes in programming areas, planning, and administration. And then we recommend pulling planning, design, and development outside, into, outside of where it is now, which is actually under landscape services and urban forestry, and instead have it standalone, really focused in driving your development process for parks and recreation. I know that parks and recreation is a major player with you all in terms of stormwater man management, sea level rise. That person or that division should be working across 
the uh, city in a variety of ways, with public works, with neighborhood preservation, all of those groups. And we think that needs to occur. Bureau of Cemeteries, I've got to tell you, they are doing a magnificent job. I've run cemeteries before in other cities. For what they have there, it is extraordinary the good work that they have going. I think, however, if their technology was up to date, they could be more efficient by combi combining all of their administrative offices, which they currently have in three sites, into one site. And then have the ability to meet on site at Calvary or at Riverside, but be focused at Forest Lawn, um, which is their kind of make it a corporate headquarters, and that would be the driver for it and reduce the unnecessary administrative oversight that they have. Um, in landscape services, there, we had a, I had a bit of a concern related to the ratio of Indians to chiefs. I think there's a lot of Indians and um, not, there's a lot of chiefs and not enough Indians. I think you need to look at your leader to staff ratios there. I think you get some improvements, more hands on deck to do the work. Um, really good work being done in urban forestry, landscape management, um, very impressive small equipment repair on top of everything there. I would encourage you to analyze the opportunities within the landscape services. They have a standalone athletic fields group. I think they could be blended into the district groups within landscape services, cross-train, get more efficiencies, and more understanding of the full breadth of landscape services in each individual group. Might be efficiency opportunity. And then computer resources centers. This falls out of any core programming for typical parks and recreation agencies. And I think it shows. Um, libraries typically are, in most municipalities, the driver of computer resources. And we would recommend that you look at changing the way the current alignment is with this expectation with park and re Parks and Recreation. Move it to the library system, particularly because there's a new library, that I believe the Tucker Library, that's going to be built, which is within a half a mile of those three computer resource centers that would all likelihood do a much better job of delivering that service. And then last but not least, we recommend closing three recreation centers. Um, the daily use there are extraordinarily low. Uh, for example, at um, Camp Compostela, there's an average daily attendance of four. Um, there is at Berkeley, uh, uh, just down the road, much greater utilization. All of these have an average daily attendance of less than 20 individuals a day, and we feel that those could be closed combined with other facilities, use those money to drive resources elsewhere to improve service delivery. Uh, close the Berkeley pool, that is past its youthful life expen expectancy. And then monitor Grandy also. Now it's not at the level yet, but they have been dropping utilization. I think you need to take a look at that, whether it's changing the program or whatever. What's nice is even though we're saying to close these facilities in these areas, the city is investing in these areas in other regards. New libraries, new schools, new uh, splash pads maybe versus a pool. So there's still going to be opportunity, but when you're only servicing four children a day, it doesn't make sense to have full-time staff there year-round. And to us, we think you can gain, gain greater efficiencies and improve programming by combining some facilities. Uh, we would, if you take those closures, and take them to bear, we then think you can redesign your current recreation and human development division from three arms to two, thereby reducing some of your administrative staff and hopefully funding the other staff that we recommended earlier that will drive forward, we believe, improved customer outcomes as well as business outcomes. Um, and then parks, urban forestry, and landscape services no longer has the planning division. As we said, we recommended that it become a fifth bureau within the department. So the structure would then look like this. You'd have a director overseeing five primary bureaus. All of those bureau managers would be capable of stepping in for the director when he was out of town or at conference or whatever, providing them growth opportunities. Um, I can tell you, we wouldn't make this recommendation, but you have some tremendous professionals there that are ready to step up to this. It also will allow them to get a greater understanding of what it takes to be the, be the leader, greater understanding of how best to work with city council. So that is our look down and dirty in terms of reorganization restructuring. Thanks, Cindy. 
the assessment also included some components within three areas, leadership system, so what is the strategic vision? Uh, we looked at mission, vision, values, what's the culture of the organization? What are we doing about leadership development? So we have a lot of information there to strengthen overall leadership. Um, then we also took a look at operations. Uh, so what are the stakeholder relationships, as we mentioned earlier, athletics, as well as the school district. Um, and then also took a look at process documentation and policies. What are those that are most significant to the external and internal customer, and what can we do to make them more efficient? And then on the financial side, interestingly enough, most park and recreation agencies rely on earned revenue beyond tax support. And on average, according to the National Recreation and Park Association, typical organization department in the US, about 30% of revenue, total revenue is earned revenue, 70 percent tax support, whereas for Norfolk it's more like seven to eight percent earned revenue. Um, and then we also noted that there should be a pricing policy to help guide the way uh, pricing is done, and then we also took a look at pricing of other ag agencies in the area and determined that the fees overall were low, but that's certainly need to keep in mind just the demographics of the community and people's ability to pay it doesn't just suggest, oh, our fees are lower than everyone, let's raise them. And then we also took a look at what's called park metrics by the National Recreation and Park Association. And it's a database of 1,069 agencies and entered a filter in there for cities between 200, 300,000 population. Uh, operating budget for Norfolk is right at the median. Um, and the thing with that is, for a recreation operation, that can vary tremendously by the number of facilities and programs that are offered. Uh, so that was at the median. We also found that 95% of park and recreation agencies are responsible for maintenance. <laughs> Uh, the big fact here that really stood out was the capital dollar amounts, that um, it's really Norfolk's at the lowest quartile, um, and that lowest quartile was $5.54 per capita. For Norfolk, it's $3.96. Uh, the next one is about staffing. Uh, the full-time staff level is higher than uh, the highest quartile that we found from these other agencies. But again, that speaks to uh, the fact that Norfolk has 18 centers, whereas for these other communities between 200 and 300,000, they have 12 recreation centers. So short-term recommendations Cindy's going to cover, and then we'll finish up with long-term recommendations. We'll be very quick here because... Yeah, no problem. We've told you about what we want. We yes, sir. Um, the only thing here that is uh, probably new that you have not heard already, and again, we'd like to hit on it, is the community needs assessment survey. I think that would help drive further changes in terms of the programs and facilities that you offer. Um, we think it's important to operationalize the city's mission, culture, and vision. Uh, the other thing we would encourage is that there be a regularly scheduled all-hands meeting for staff during this time of change as you're going through change initiatives uh, so that they would understand what's happening and are part, part of that. Um, recreation, the athletic associations and recreation center advisory groups, we really believe there needs to be a better process of understanding the financial relationship between the city and those organizations. I'm not sure that it is one that is balanced and that deserves some looking at. Um, and then working with Norfolk Public Schools to improve service delivery and facility access would be very important. And then just a couple of uh, long-term ones, just the te developing a technology plan. Uh, developing uh, robust key performance indicators, uh, expanding recreation program <coughs> offerings according to just what the gaps in services are, uh, and then just taking a look at cost of service pricing, and all of that realm of work. Um, and then doing a cost-benefit analysis on a regular basis to determine are there opportunities to save money, become more efficient, effective, in-house versus contracting, or the reverse of that. Uh, and then also developing long-term <coughs> replacement schedules. Um, and then some typical things that you would find for any department, working with human resources on salaries, uh, onboarding process, identifying core competencies and training around that, and developing a succession plan for senior leaders. So I think that is it. Yes, summary. Uh, 
discussion questions yeah um, yeah I guess I guess I got several number one I go started one of the last things you mentioned was closing uh, campus Stella recreation center the problem there is that um, there's no adequate programming for the youngsters. And so if anything, that uh, the program need to be looked at. And they these these are youngsters, you know, that walk. And Berkeley is a long way for them. Anywhere they had to go, they're major thoroughfares. And so somehow that, that has to be looked at. Grandy Village is you mentioned closing that. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it has a swimming pool there. And uh, they had an uh, an attempt last year to close it. I see there's an underhandedness in um, uh, trying to change the demographics there. That's that's two blocks from the uh, light rail system. So what do we do? Let's get rid of all of the people who need services there and let's go to market rent for people who are tired of walking, driving on the expressway and they can walk two blocks and get on the, uh, the, um, the light rail. Uh, parks and forestry, um, that, that, that what concerns me there is that our cemeteries, school grounds, right of ways, grass cutting, and beautification that should be that should be one of the uh, number one aspects. Of, I, I really went to the manager and asked him about that because I believe parks and rec and uh, uh, parks and forestry should be two totally separate energy energies because they're budget driven. And so you, you, you want to cut grass at the school and you're having a problem over here with your recreation so what you do, you don't cut grass, you change the cycles, you know. And so I hope this is something that we'll look at. Um, uh, it's, it's an excellent information in here, but you had to rush through it. And I'm just not satisfied that we can embrace something like this without further discussion. You know, everything is money driven. Uh, and not only with you know recreation fees, but a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And you have to look at your demographics, which you did mention. Uh, a lot of the uh, uh, communities that we serve, we don't have the ability, you know, to pay fees. As a matter of fact, a lot of services we're probably giving away. But in giving away, we might be saving a life. We might be keeping a child from committing suicide. So you have a very, very in-depth discussion. I'm just sorry that you had to rush through it because it's just so much thing, so many things in there that are important. But uh, I just can't agree with it, you know. But thank you so much. You did a great effort. So All just right. to be clear, not asking council to do anything tonight. So Mr. Ms. Briggs' points are well made, obviously, and uh, lots to digest and go through. And, and we'll do that. We'll do that with council, frankly. So not, at, not asking you to make any decisions. Nothing in this budget that y'all are talking about now would be reflected, uh, none of this report would be reflected in the upcoming budget. Angela and Mr. Smeagol. Um, a couple things. When you talked about utilization, what time period did you utilization use? Utilization of recreation centers mm -hmm. and the, the staff provided it from a six month period and it was an average daily attendance rating. So we asked the staff to provide that to us. So basically the winter? Uh, no, it, no was, it was from last year. Okay, last, yes, okay. Yes, ma'am. Last. Yes, but we finished the report at the end of the year. So it was okay. the previous year, so 2018. So it took into consideration the summer. Yes, ma'am. Okay, all right. And then um, my question to you, Doug, yeah. is um, when you talk about having a specific person for marketing from ARPOs and a specific person for technology, what does that then do to all of our other departments? Because I think once you start adding specific marketing people for this department and specific technology people for this department, then other departments may come along. And it may be something that you wanna take a look at and, and do something in a portfolio style similar mm -hmm. to your deputy city managers. Mm -hmm. So your deputy city managers have a portfolio of departments that they deal with. And so within marketing, within corporate marketing, we you may look at a portfolio style where individuals will be hired to cover parks and rec, they will be hired to cover libraries, they will be hired, you know, they'll 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 do that. And the same thing with technology. I mean, I think we all know that our technology is not, you know, top of the line. We're working from you're investing in it. It's we, getting a whole lot better. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We're, we are investing in it to, to get it better. Um, the last thing is on the NEL program. I'm not sure that I agree with that recommendation either, just because um, it doesn't, NEL is not just our post. NEL puts, in, puts young people 
in positions across the city of Norfolk. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that that should change from the managers, from the administration. Well, it's not mine. That's what it's she said. It's, post. it's our post. It's our oh. post. It's administration. Oh, she's saying okay. they're our post. It's in the wrong place. Okay. 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 Right. Okay. Right. I thought you meant the opposite. Okay, so no, you're saying it should come out of our post and into... No, ma'am. I'm saying it should come out of our post's administrative Okay. Bureau and into the Parks and Recreation, the Park uh, Recreation and Human Development, which is what this program is about, okay. is put it under that arm because really administration should be internally focused about delivering systems to the operators to be successful. And so adding a program is difficult to manage. Put it where they're already doing great programming okay. and they already have significant interaction with. Uh, recreation and human development as well as other departments as you said okay all right I, I think I agree with that but just I think I agree with that um, and I think that's all I had except for the fact that I agree with Mr. Riddick on not closing the um, the, the centers and I certainly don't want to close her place the Merrimack the Merrimack, the Merrimack. Merrimack Lane Merrimack Landing that's in that's, um, um, that's, that's you the Merrimack Might be Martin. Mar okay. Uh, All right. Yeah, well, I so again, yeah, what you've got now is one data one now. Now is the of this table is. to make decisions. So. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't agree with the closing part. Ways, but I think I think programming. I think once we if looking at programming and doing a needs assessment on what community needs and what young people are looking for nowadays, because I think there probably are some outdated programs and things of that nature, and that may drive. Um, and that may drive interest. I think four, average attendance of four is abysmal. So I think we need to find a way to get young people interested um, because that's a lot of money to spend. And I think that's where they're coming. For, forget the um, sort of the method. I think what you're hearing on the marketing side, whether it's a solo <coughs> post or in our post, because we're doing the portfolio kind of like you're describing. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the message I take is we're not doing enough marketing, enough marketing within this to let people know you got some really what good products out there. What we have, I agree with that. Up, so. I can agree with that. Okay. All right, Ms. Johnson. Um, last year, over me. That's okay. Oh, okay. Ladies okay. first. Go okay. ahead. Um, last so year, when we had um, this discussion about the low attendance, one of the recommendations was to partner with Norfolk Public Schools and that somehow the children, the scholars are in need of uh, remediation across the board. Mm -hmm. And part of the recommendation was to partner with Norfolk Public Schools so that we could possibly bring up the attendance at some of the, the centers mm -hmm. um, mentioned up here. And I know, I'm sorry. And I know you mentioned the partnership between mm -hmm. Norfolk Public Schools. So the city council was ahead of that last year. So now it comes down to coming up with a plan and putting it in action because we do have the data from mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. that says that the numbers are low and we have Campostella Elementary School and a couple of other schools nearby these centers, it should be a partnership for our scholars so that they can have um, success mm -hmm. beyond what the school may be able to offer. We then the community have a partnership so that we can continue to help the children. Mm -hmm. And we said that last year. Yeah, I remember that. Just a couple things. Um, first, I want to recognize our uh, commissioners that are here today. I think if you guys can please stand. I know some of our board and commissioner members are here. Hi. Thanks. And thank you for coming out and supporting this. Um, quick question. Did you guys recommend a name change to the organization? Because the ARPOS name is just something that seems archaic um, to me. And when you're looking at branding and opportunities, um, if you bring in marketing, or were you saving that for another conversation? It really wasn't asked of us okay. in terms of coming forward with a recommendation like that. Um, I think if you did a full community needs assessment, and you had a sense of what they want you to be, you can then build on that from a marketing perspective on what is the best way to display and communicate what you are. Okay. 
and, you know, and the, or what you aspire to be. The television show Parks and Recreation didn't help with the stereotype <laughs> yes. of Parks and Recreation, right. but um, you know our staff, we do have an outstanding yes, staff, um, and they're very responsive when we have issues that come up. Um, I do strongly support actually um, our post. I think there's some departments that do need their own marketing people. We probably have existing staff that we can move into that position that have that skill, but I think that they're they need it because um, a lot of Norfolk citizens actually do not know what services are available and we really need to go there's an impression and we talked about this I mean I very much enjoyed our conversation and I think I was able to give you some um, on the ground feedback from my experiences but citizens have a, uh, an idea of what our parks and rec is and they don't know all the other um, aspects of it um, and they want to compare us to Virginia Beach um, but it's different models completely yes. different models and so we need people to understand that I think marketing is a really important piece of that. I do want to go back to the bullet. I think it's one of the most important pieces that we as a council need to work on, which is the athletic associations and then also the um, um, the school system relationship. So the athletic associations real quickly um, is probably more political than the city council and it has to end. Um, it has to stop. Um, and there we unfortunately have created a culture in Norfolk where some of these organizations can bully their way um, through things and the only way that I can see us going there is to just eliminate them altogether um, and move to a more centralized um, type system um, where it's, our kids can register and then be placed on teams um, it's unfortunate what I saw as a soccer coach um, and what we've heard over the years um, and I, I also don't like the idea of our kids begging on street corners uh, for equipment and things and I think some of that culture is perpetuated through these associations or organizations because kids have to look or they have to have certain types of shoes um, and I, I think that unfortunately I don't want to put that on on the staff I think that's gonna have to come from City Council we're the ones that are gonna have to take some of the political beating of uh, if we were to move forward with that and I'm ready to start that conversation no matter what happens but I'm ready to move forward with eliminating some of these people that have been causing problems um, with our I think it's hurting and stifling the growth of athletics in the city of Norfolk because we've allowed the associations with that I think we do need to have uh, continued conversations with the school system um, and and I, I can see it from both sides of this um, you know we have shared um, facilities in which nobody wants to take ownership for who's responsible for repair um, and we, we have, I think, schools that could be utilized, uh, but because it's principals or, or, um, that get to make the decision on whether or not an organization uses it, and I respect their opinion that uh, organizations can come in and damage the facility and then nobody's fixing it. And, and trying to figure out a, a way to, um, who is responsible for that or having a shared budget um, that somebody can come in and fix a gym floor if it gets damaged, or even if there's a leaky roof, there's there's a, a, a kind of unfortunate back and forth. And I have heard sometimes, well, we give the school system all this money, so you know they should be responsible for it, but they also are limited in what they can do as well. And and I hear the other side of it, where mm -hmm. Parks and Rec doesn't have enough money mm -hmm. to be able to do this. And I've heard arguments over toilet paper. I've heard argument. I think that there's a way that we can come to a common agreement and common ground. I think there's models out there that we can utilize and I think putting the right people at the table to have these conversations, I think we could work it out. Um, and I, I think because we have wonderful, beautiful new schools that have been built that have nice gyms and facilities that could be utilized in some communities where there are no parks. There's not one recreation center in, on, on any side of West Ocean View. We have a brand new Ocean View school there. Um, that has a gym that could be utilized, but I understand the concern of the wear and tear and the damage of those buildings and how we can get there. So I'm looking forward to continued conversations. I don't believe this was enough time to do that. Maybe committees would help with this. Um, That's but a great idea, Tom. Yeah, um, I think that we. This is a big deal. Parks and Recreations is always a, not on the top of the list for citizens' concerns and where we should be funding and we should be spending more time. On them and I don't think we've given that department enough justice over the years and Doug before you came in they were cut they were cut and they were cut and they have not been restored to what they should have been restored at and things have been pulled out things have been put back but the money hasn't flowed with them okay
And we said, council said, that our post is one of our top priorities as far as how our city looks. We, we said that that was a priority for us. And so we need to honor that. All right. Okay. Courtney, do you have the last word? Uh, Angela, do you have something? Yeah, I just okay. was going to pick back on Tommy. Word. Courtney, then Angela. So following on with what Tommy said, we have a joint use agreement with the <coughs> schools and the city, and that has not worked well for both nope. parties. And I think both would acknowledge that, but both need to come to the table with very open minds and making that a successful agreement because then that will resolve any of the friction between the two parties. And so whoever needs to sit at the table to make that happen, I'm willing to do that myself. So we really need to work together because that will eliminate any of the emotion in the room and the who is going to pay for what and who has access to what. I also like that you are looking at the data and that the decisions that we make at our post are data driven. I would also say to echo Tommy that for years, our post has been one to say, they can do it, they can do it, they can do it with no added resources. One good example was when light rail came online, seven miles, they were then asked to take care of the um, landscape and recite as a, you know, on the, uh, the line. They didn't have any additional money allocated for that. They just had to actually absorb that into their operating budget. Um, and then I do agree, it was about a year ago that I think the marketing person was removed and put back into the city central marketing department. So maybe making that, again, a standalone is a good idea. But I think the JUA with the schools and making that work well, and I know that the ARPOS commission is very interested in coming to the table on that, and we need to get Norfolk Public Schools to have the same commitment to the come to the table on that as well. If I may, Councilor, just quickly. then administration can operate it. But it's really going to take the leadership of council with the leadership of the school board to get that agreement redone. I agree, and I'm willing to be a part of that conversation. I am too. Me too. Me too. Me too. Now, the only thing I was going to say is, you know, in part of that um, process of, of schools and uh, community use, but when it comes to organizations utilizing, I mean, at some point we're going to have to hold the organizations responsible. They just can't come in and tear up our buildings. And so, yes, there's, you know, there's a city responsibility, there's a school responsibility and who does what, but these organizations that come in have some responsibility as well to leave the school, the gym, the whatever it is, um, the way that they found it and not do any further harm to it so that they have a place to come back to that is, you know, usable, functional, and, and whatnot as well. So there's a three-way, there's a three-prong approach to this as well in terms of not just the school and not just the city, but the organizations that use them. All right, thank you both for Barbara and Cindy. Thank, thank you, you both, thank you very much, okay? Thank you, Mr. Smith. So Mayor, I would thank the, um, the council, the, uh, the commission, uh, Daryl's team, um, all of whom have been re were really receptive to this, this, this deep look. And I think we've got a lot of data and a lot of information that allow us to, to get to where you all want to be relative to this. Right. I'm going to ask. I need executive summaries on your next three or four presentations. You got it. Okay. Here's what I'm going to do. We're going to skip one. And uh, I'm going to ask Bob Crumb to take like three minutes, Bob. And Doug, you don't even get to introduce him. Y'all all know Bob Crumb. Yeah. He is going to let you know where you are on the Jay uh, J Loose. And then Greg's going to give you 10 minutes on budget. And we're done. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, City Council members. I'm going to give you the high level overview of our joint land use study. Uh, really, goals of this study. This is an opportunity that we've been working on for the past uh, 18 months or so to bring together the cities of Norfolk, Virginia Beach, and your military installations to take a look at issues related to coastal flooding and sea level rise and the impact that they're having on the essential uh, operations of those military installations. Uh, we've been involved in a process that's involved your technical staff uh, is going to really start involving your policymakers now to come up with ideas, look at vulnerability assessments, try to understand what's threatening these bases uh, and, and some things that we can do collectively as a community to, to really implement some workable strategies. Uh, this is the study area that we're taking a look at. Of course, it involves the two cities and your primary uh, military installations of Naval Station Norfolk, uh, of course, um, uh, J Jeb uh, Little Creek Fort Story, uh, down in uh, Virginia Beach, we have Oceana and Dam Neck Annex. Um, as we started this process, uh, what we challenged ourselves to take a look at is what are those conditions that are affecting the Navy's mission? 
Um, and, and frankly, what we're finding is, and I'll show you some maps in a moment, but really it boils down to a pretty basic issue. Um, we're seeing increased uh, times, as you're well aware, um, where even during blue sky days, some of our roads are beginning to flood. We think that's going to worsen in the future. And one of the primary things we can do to help our military installations is ensure they can get their personnel to work in a consistent manner. Uh, it was more than transportation. We're looking at assessing community facilities and services, understanding how the military relies on local infrastructure, particularly outside the gate, to support their uh, military operations. And again, looking what communities can do to support those personnel installations, things ranging from uh, making certain we have reliable and resilient access routes to work for our military personnel, what we can do from a stormwater management standpoint, uh, reliable and resilient uh, utility networks, and how we can work together as a region to perhaps bring some outside resources to solve some of these problems and challenges. Uh, the study took a quick look or a detailed look at some flooding scenarios. What you have here is a map, and I could provide you a larger version, but what you see here in light blue, those are areas that are flooding today. So if you go out today, these are areas of Norfolk and Virginia Beach that you're starting to see um, flooding happen. But what gets interesting and challenging for us, the darker blue areas show the areas that are going to flood under sea level rise scenarios of one and a half feet and sea level rise scenarios of three feet. And just to give you one example, you can start overlaying those scenarios then on those infrastructure, the critical infrastructure that we talked about and the first that we really were really interested in is transportation. Um, so what this starts showing is areas of our two cities um, where roadways are going to have flooding impacts. Um, the red roadways show you areas that are flooding today. Uh, the gold color shows you what's going to happen when sea level rise increases by one and a half feet. And the green area shows you areas that are going to flood um, in three feet uh, of sea level rise. And what that really starts to point out is that there's a couple primary areas where we're going to start to see some significant challenges related to impacts in the military. For the city of Norfolk, Hampton Boulevard rises to the top of that list, and I know you're, you're, you're very aware of those, those challenges. Um, East Ocean View is another area that you start to see uh, showing up on this map that's, um, oh, sorry, Doug, I'm not pointing too well, but um, you're, you see uh, um, areas in that area that are going to start to feel the impacts. Uh, in Virginia Beach, it's Shore Drive. Uh, that, that is going to be uh, problematic. So those are some areas that we really have identified that we really need to think about how we focus in on in terms of collaboration and bringing some resource to bear on those problems. So the joint land use study contains recommendations for 23 actions. Those represent projects and initial actions that we believe we can take as two cities, as a region. 23 regional coordination strategies and seven conversations, and I just want to pause and talk about this a second. What's so important is the framework that we need to create moving forward after we endorse this study as two cities. Really, the, what, what this has done is it's brought together military, the cities, collectively to develop a consensus on what these strategies and actions can be. And we're really going to need to work with you to establish what those implementation mechanisms look like. We think it's going to need to be a, a joint roundtable or a committee from the two cities with the military all at the table so we can move these items forward in a, in a very efficient manner. Um, I mentioned um, two of the top recommended actions, Hampton Boulevard and Shore Drive. The J. Lou study talks about comprehensive flood mitigation and stormwater management strategies for those corridors. Um, what we're looking at moving forward is our project consultant, this AECOM, is currently incorporating feedback, working with the technical committee. Um, Mayor Alexander, you and Mr. Smith will be invited to our policy committee meeting on April 25. We'll talk about these recommendations in more detail. Uh, council members, that would put us in the community in May and June for public meetings, because that's going to be important part to get some input. And then that will move us forward for endorsement. Um, uh, I'll pause there. Here we've got a policy <laughs> committee uh, meeting next week, and then you're gonna, your um, uh, constituents are going to be invited to these community meetings in May and June, so we wanted you to have a framework for 
uh, knowing what's happening there, but I'm grateful for the work that Doug and Christine and others are doing for us. All right, great. Let's talk budget, buddy. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council, uh, Mr. Smith. Uh, Megan's passing around this year's updated uh, revenue uh, uh, rules of thumb, and you will see it's reflective of the fact that we have a revenue sharing program uh, with NPS now. Uh, so we're last year, a, a penny was worth 1.85 million. Uh, this year, a penny is worth 1.92 million, uh, but uh, about 70% of that comes to the, to, the, uh, to the city, and about 30% of that uh, would go to Norfolk Public Schools. Uh, also wanted to let you know that the uh, dashboard, CIP dashboard that you saw last week is live and posted on the budget toolkit and we'll get you links uh, to both instructions and that dashboard uh, uh, here shortly. Uh, first, let's take a look at our budget calendar, the progress we've made. You've got two tick marks, one for the uh, budget presentation, one for the first work session. Today is the second work session. Tomorrow night at 6 p.m. is the public hearing at Granby High School. Uh, from there, we'll finish with uh, budget adoption on, on May 14th. Um, an overview of the presentation, we're going to take a look at some budget best, uh, best practice improvements that we've done this year, uh, some non-general fund highlights, and then fi finally some general fund highlights. Uh, before we dive in, I uh, want to take a look at the council inquiry process again. Again, council can make inquiries at work sessions uh, to, your, to the city manager at your one-on-ones um, or through your uh, deputy city manager. Uh, we will um, uh, publish all council inquiries uh, each Friday. Um, in the CM update and also on the budget toolkit page uh, so everyone can stay on top of the questions that have been ans uh, asked uh, and, the, and the responses uh, from the budget office. Again, keep in mind that uh, any action requires a balancing action, so any expense we add to the budget uh, requires either an expense to come out of the budget or additional revenue into the budget. Um, uh, some of our best practice uh, improvements, uh, one that's not listed on the slide, I, I wanted to thank Mr. Pishko's office uh, for the first time ever, we have proposed ordinances in the budget. Uh, typically in the past, we never published ordinances in the proposed budget. We'd wait till, um, till we adopted. Uh, you would see the ordinance basically a couple days before you voted on it. Now we've got proposed ordinances in the, doc in the, uh, in the budget document, so you can read through you know, what ultimately becomes, uh, becomes law. Um, we have, uh, this year we're really excited about what we're calling our annual grants plan. Uh, so on page 93 of the budget, we have actually identified um, uh, the grants that we receive every year, so recurring grants that we receive every year, uh, rather than sending them uh, through the council docket one grant at a time through the year. Uh, we've uh, acknowledged all of those grants up front. We're going to, uh, as part of the budget process, uh, adopt an up to amount for all of those grants. That'll cover, um, it's almost $30 million of, of grants that support about 78 positions each year. Um, and it really gives the reader of the budget, the residents of Norfolk, a better understanding of the total spend plan that we have. This is $30 million that would have been hard to track down through the budget process. But now that we are uh, recording it, including it in the budget, uh, again, it's a better reflection of the, the total spend plan that we have. Um, this is kind of uh, uh, a position-based budgeting. Uh, we moved towards position-based budgeting last year. We fully adopted it this year. Won't go through all of these points, but what's important is this is a best practice. Departments have the resources now to fill all of their positions, um, and we're recognizing the fact that there's vacancy turnover every year. Not all positions are always filled, but rather than you know uh, recognize that within each department, we've recognized that centrally, and all departments still have the opportunity to fill uh, all of their positions, which is definitely a best practice. Um, MPS uh, local revenue allocation or the revenue sharing program. Uh, council adopted the revenue sharing program um, as part of last year's uh, budget process. This is the first year we put it to work. Uh, I think by by almost all accounts, it's been um, it's been a it's been a huge success. Communication with the uh, with the school district was great this year. Uh, it helped that every time we talked to them, we told them that we uh, we thought they'd get a little bit more money. Uh, that's not always going to happen. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it's really. Um, uh, the, the, most importantly for us, the school board adopted a budget that's within the revenue uh, that's provided by the, by the school funding formula, uh, and it really allows us to shift the conversation, hopefully, away from funding and towards uh, success in the, uh, of, of the schools. Uh, some non-general fund highlights. I think you guys are familiar with most of these. Uh, on, the, on the stormwater fund, we have the budget does equalize rates between residential and non-residential customers, uh, which is uh, you know, something that every 
um, uh, locality here in the area does. It's going to um, generate about $3.8 million in new revenue, uh, which will allow us to uh, facilitate the conversion of stormwater to an enterprise fund and address more flooding projects quicker. Uh, on the waste management side, there is a two, there is go, the budget does include a $2 increase uh, to the waste management fee uh, to uh, continue the recycling program. We did, uh, I think, one of the largest uh, surveys that we've ever done of, of our residents uh, this year regarding recycling. 62% said they wanted to continue the recycling program. The budget does include uh, the additional $2 per month to make sure that that happens. Keep in mind, last year we reduced that fee by $3. So even with this $2 increase, it's still a buck less than residents were paying uh, in fiscal year 2018. And then on the health care fund, total premium increase this year of 4%. Uh, but what's really important is uh, that the, the city employees will not see an increase in calendar year 2020 uh, on their health care premiums. Uh, so real estate assessments, uh, this is our total assessed value. Um, as you can see, last year in uh, fiscal year 2019, we find our total assessed value finally climbed above our pre-recession recession peak in fiscal year 2010. Uh, in fiscal year 2020, we're projecting the largest year-over-year uh, -year increase in assessments, 3.7% uh, since uh, the end of the recession. Uh, that's great news, and you can see we're, we're now well above our assessment peak, uh, pre-recession peak in fiscal year 2010. If we look at other revenue sources, you see kind of um, how much additional money we're projecting uh, from fiscal year 2019 into fiscal year 2020. Um, so real estate tax, our largest local revenue source, we're projecting um, $8.2 million increase. Uh, really seeing great growth in our hotel tax. Um, we're, we're, we're figuring on um, get the, the um, Glasslight Hotel coming online, which will really help. Seeing growth in meals, in sales, and personal property. Um, a couple areas I did want to highlight here, communication sales and use tax. Um, this, is a, this is a revenue that is declining each year. It's, it's, it's managed by the state. City of Norfolk receives a set percent of all the revenue that they collect. As people unplug and use cable less, use phones differently, we're seeing less revenue every year. Uh, this is an area where we'd really like to work with the state to, to look at modernizing uh, how this tax is, is, is charged. Uh, and also fees. You can see we've reduced our uh, budget for uh, fees from uh, fiscal year 19 to fiscal year 2020. Uh, so if you recall last year, we implemented a number of new fees. Um, our, uh, we've collected um, a lot more money in fee revenue in fiscal year 19 than we did in fiscal year 18. However, we may have been a little bit optimistic in how much revenue those, uh, those new fees were going to generate. Uh, so we did uh, kind of align our, our budget for fee revenue uh, with, with what we're seeing in fiscal year 2019. Expenditure drivers, uh, these are, these are uh, 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 items that you, we have discussed in the past. Uh, debt service is increasing by over $10 million between fiscal year 19 and fiscal year 2020. Um, based on our uh, planned CIP, this is the last year we're projecting to see a really big increase in debt service, which is going to give us some uh, budget relief, hopefully, uh, going forward. Again, annualizing our salary increase, contractual and inflationary obligations increasing by over $3 million. Uh, additional $3 million to Norfolk Public Schools and employee benefits, so healthcare and retirement are increasing by a little bit more than $1.7 million. Uh, to review some operating budget enhancements, uh, first, um, organizational enhancements, creating uh, the new Department of Transit to really manage our multimodal uh, operations and planning, um, uh, the creation of the St. Paul's Area Transformation Division within the, op the uh, Office of, uh, of Resilience. Um, which is really going to focus on implementing people first and um, managing the redevelopment project. Some other operating budget highlights, funds to uh, create an independent community development corporation for St. Paul's, funding for the lifelong learning and climate change uh, committee recommendations, uh, funding for a coastal engineer to support large infrastructure projects and to work with the uh, um, Army Corps of Engineers, uh, two additional positions at the Norfolk Animal Care Center, uh, funding for a diversity and inclusion officer, uh, and funding for our regional uh, public safety initiatives that Deputy City Manager Mike Goldsmith is working hard on. Um, highlights for Team Norfolk, salary increase in fiscal year 2020 that will start mid-year, so in January again, 2% for general employees and constitutional officer employees, a step increase for sworn police and fire rescue, um, a continuation of the second year of the four-year uh, pay plan implement new pay plan implementation for deputy sheriffs. They'll see on average about a five 
uh, percent increase, and this plan ultimately will make them more competitive regionally. A new pay plan for benefit eligibility workers that will they'll actually be effective in, in July. These are the folks that are working with our most vulnerable residents to make sure that they qualify uh, for all of the, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the social services programs that the state and the, and the federal government has to offer. Uh, we did a study. They were um, very underpaid compared to their regional competitors. They'll see on average more than an 8 percent increase. Again, no increase to the employee share of health care premiums. A couple of successes we've had, our gain sharing program, which will continue in fiscal year 2020, generated over $150,000 of budget savings. Uh, and we're con continuing our investment in our Agile Team Norfolk program, which is a program that encourages all of our frontline employees um, to take a look at the processes um, that they use every day, how, those, how we can make those processes uh, uh, more streamlined, more effective, more efficient. Um, so that's a program we're really excited about. and We've already seen it, it bear fruit. Uh, noteworthy reductions um, in order to close the budget gap and make sure we had funds available to uh, fund new initiatives. We had to find savings within the, uh, within the department budgets. On page 416 in the budget, there is a, uh, a section that, that reviews all of the reduction scenarios uh, that, we, that were used in this year's budget. I'll just run through a few here. Uh, we, you know, we've far fewer inmates in our jail right now, so we've adjusted our um, funding for food and medical contracts to match utilization. Uh, we removed funding for long-time vacant positions, um, so positions that have been vacant more than, more than a year. Uh, we've uh, uh, found um, savings on, on fuel based on utilization. We've, we've become a little bit more energy efficient, so or fuel efficient in our vehicles. So not that the price of fuel is falling, but our use of fuel is decreasing, especially on the school side. Um, and um, we've found savings in our audit contract and a number of other <coughs> items. And that's all I have for Nobody council likes, today. Reduce funds for street lighting. No, by using LED lights, okay. we're saving money. Okay. And we're going to continue to do that, right? Yeah, there's actually a CIP project that is um, essentially a revolving fund. So all the savings we found from these uh, from converting to LED is being plowed back into uh, supporting more replacement of LED lights. So it'll actually build on itself. The more we save, the more lights we can replace, the more efficient we can become. Hey, Mr. Smeagol, then Mr. Toll. So just to be a little bit critical of the budget process, and I was like this last year, I don't feel like these are work sessions. I feel like they are lectures. Yeah. And there's a lot of repetition in these PowerPoints, Doug, that you just need to pull out that you already went over with us right. and give us the opportunity to talk about we stuff. Got we got a little short change. Right. Y'all are not planning these meetings out right because I, I don't know what's going on with we the. Didn't, we didn't intend to start at 520. Well, somebody's got to communicate. So I don't, you know, but we've got, we need time to talk and I feel rushed in this. I um, I, I do want to add just a question later on that could be answered. Fees are down and I'm wondering if they're down because we increased the fees so that we scared away people. And I, 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 I want to see more of those numbers. Um, it, it, that was one of the things that stood out to me. Um, I've asked in the past, uh, I brought it, I'm going to bring it up again. I know there's other council members that are interested in um, the vote tax um, and eliminating that uh, tax. Um, I don't think, I've never said that we need to eliminate it in one swoop. I don't think we can afford to do that. But I think because of all the other localities either charging nothing or that I think one's a penny, um, some are that people are moving their boats out of Norfolk and we're not getting the other revenues that could come in um, from that. And I'd be I'd be happy if you guys could do a better analysis. I've talked to Evans Poston and the commissioner's revenue revenues office. It's a, a very hard um, uh, thing for his office to do. Um, and so it, to collect, to collect is a lot of um, time is spent on not even collecting some of the revenues from that. Um, I'd love to know that the fishing permits, because now that we opened up Lake Whitehurst, if that has increased, um, and could that revenue, because at one time we had like 1,900 fishing permits in Norfolk, and it went all the way down when we closed Lake Whitehurst to like nothing. Um, it was just the people that were getting it for the lakes we own in Suffolk. And whether or not that revenue could be used, or um, we could offset some of this with maybe a sticker fee or, or a registration fee um, instead of that. I know that that may have an impact on the school system. Um, and so I, I want to make sure the revenue that whatever we can do, 
that we have a good analysis of where we can make up that money. Our marinas are hurting. I have the biggest marina. Andrew has all the marinas um, in, in hers, and we hear it from the marina operators all the time that they're really hurting um, because of that tax, that it scares people away from that. And if we can find a way to get a good balance, maybe not completely eliminate it, but um, get it low enough that it would make people comfortable, um, we do that. And I don't know if tomorrow's, um, Kenny, if tomorrow's uh, budget hearing is light um, and we don't have a lot of speakers, maybe we could spend a little bit of time <coughs> afterwards if anybody has other. I'd like to hear from council members about what they've come up with the budget. Courtney's talked to me about a few things down the line, but I'm sure that other Keep people have. The is, is, is purely you all talking about what you've been hearing. Yeah. Right, so no presentations, it's all subject. Courtney to Ms. Cruz. So last week we had a conversation regarding capital, and I wanted to bring up one um, point in capital, which is an unfunded capital request. And Doug, we have spoken about this, and I've talked to several on council about this as well. And that's the um, Nauticus Capital Campaign. It's a $7.5 million over five years, five year, over five years, but with a match from the foundation that they would raise. So the idea is, can we put a million dollars in this year's budget? I know that it was asked for to be a million five, but really I'm only suggesting it be a million um, so that we can move this project along. It's actually a renovation of Nauticus. It's been 30 years since Nauticus has been renovated. Basically, it's a refresh on, I think, floors one and two, but on floor three, it's a major renovation. And the idea is that it's going to focus on STEM as well. And they have, you know, a very strong sailing program and other programs as it relates to children, so I think their area of focus is to redevelop that. And I do think that's a strong asset for our community, and the idea that they could raise the money and match what the city's willing to put in, I think is very positive. So I would ask for us to consider that moving forward. Um, I just would like, um, I have asked for, um, and this is it with regard to St. Paul's and the CDC, um, this came to the budget and Doug and I had a brief conversation about it and it has not come before the advisory committee at all. It's coming, I've asked for a presentation to the advisory committee, this coming advisory committee meeting. But the problem that I have with it is that it's something that came about outside of the advisory committee. It didn't come to the advisory committee before it made it into the budget. And neither has it come to the community to get any kind of impact on what they would like to see um, as far as the content, the makeup. Um, is it a CDC? Do we do a nonprofit? Do we do a public private partnership? What are the options? And so if we are really going to be engaging the community and asking them for their input, we don't need to just do things outside the city, outside the committee, and then put it in the budget for the St. Paul's for the St. Paul's quadrant. We can't say that we're inclusive, including the residents. And we certainly can't say that the advisory committee has any kind of input because it hadn't, I mean, it had not been for me asking for it to be presented at our next meeting. Who was going to present it? And when was it going, and when was it going to come to the advisory committee meeting? Because it hasn't. All right. So this has been talked about since the days of purpose bill. So, so this goes back to this. So having a, a nonprofit community quarterback, all we're doing right now is putting the money and no, nobody ever funded it, right? Okay, so and I get is, that it's been talked about. So, so, so no model is being proposed to you. All we're asking you to do is fund it. Okay, so but here's the thing. I get that it's been talked about and a whole bunch of stuff has been talked about with regard to St. Paul's for the last 10 years. Now we actually have an advisory committee in place. So whatever was talked about, I mean, we're not gonna go back and pull pro, uh, uh, um, we're not going to go back and pull um, ideas and plans off the shelf from 10 years ago and put them in the budget without talking to the advisory committee. So when Purpose Built was originally brought to us, there was no advisory committee. There wasn't even money for CNI. So, so whatever is going to happen with St. Paul's needs
needs to come before the advisory committee, before it shows up in a presentation, before it shows up on paper, and have the advisory committee to vet it, look at different options, run it by the community. We've got community members there, and these things need to be decided by the advisory committee that's supposed to be advising on St. Paul's. Again, all we're doing is putting the money forward. Well, I mean, even at that, we still need to make sure that if we're putting money towards something, that whatever it is that we're putting money towards is, is something that has been approved, recommended, vetted, or whatever by the advisory committee. That's all that I'm saying. Okay. It, whatever it is, if it's got to do with St. Paul's, it needs to come through the advisory committee because otherwise, what's the point of having the committee? If y'all just going to tell us what you're going to do. understand what we're supposed to be doing right now because if I've got a whole I got lots of little stickies and lots of little notes and things that I so think you, you want so, my feedback on. So, so, so again, the right, right. again next the, the, the and I hear Mr. Smeagle but the what we said we would be doing Tommy, was um, Tom, Tom, presenting Tom to you on CIP. Tommy's absolutely right. Yep. This yeah. is this is redundant. Uh, all your, all your, no disrespect to you Greg. Yes, sir. Have you presented the same thing Doug presented to us upstairs? Uh, for the budget presentation. Right. So it's a little redundancy here, okay. but we're going to give you grace. All right. But again, so the 23rd is, is just you all talking. So. so, but here's my concern on the 23rd. We're not going to have enough time. And then we're going to get right back to where we are. So as far as I'm concerned, we should start earlier. We should start earlier. Because this is, I think this is, if, mm -hmm. as, as far as we, what we're elected to do, this is one of the most critical things that we on city council are elected to do. And God forbid we are rushed to have a conversation because we don't have the opportunity to share. And plus, mm -hmm. I got lots of things I want to share, but I, I want to do. I think we need to start earlier. It's just planning the presentations better. I don't think we need. The budget. I think yeah, we need to have more time. I don't to think talk. some of the presentations, mm -hmm. you know, are scheduled. Well, the next the next time we're going to be speaking is on the twenty third. So, we, and so I think we need to make sure that we that is devoted to having the discussion around the table. All right. So you duly noted. All right. Rich, Mr. Bull. All right, Mr. Bull. I move that members of the council assemble informally and close meeting on April 9, 2019, at 6:37 in the 10th Eight floor six. conference room of the City Hall building in the City of Norfolk. For purposes of which are set out in clauses three and five, subsection A of Section 2.2-3711 of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, as amended. Clause three, discussion of acquisition of real property in the Ocean View area. Clause five, discussion concerning a prospective business or industry where no previous announcement has been made of the business or industry's interest in locating or expanding its facilities in the community. Ms. Doyle? Aye. Ms. Graves? Aye. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Ms. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagle? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Mr. Alexander? Aye. Can we get back here in about three minutes?